Hello and welcome to video lecture number 91. Uh, today we are talking about forging a protest movement from 1955 to 1965. We have two subsections today. The first is nonviolent civil disobedience, and the second is legislating civil rights from 63 to 65. So despite uh, victories such as the Brown decision, uh, civil rights activists faced tremendous opposition from a broad base of whites who sought to protect the status quo. In response to the Brown decision, uh, many U.S. congressmen and senators signed the Southern Manifesto, a declaration condemning the decision and assuring Southern constituents that their representatives would resist by any lawful means uh, judges who made law from the bench, what was then called judicial uh, usurpation or encroachment. Despite this and other forms of resistance, blacks continued to organize and embrace nonviolent forms of protest, such as the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott of 1955 and 1956. Uh, triggered by Rosa Parks, a black woman who was arrested after refusing to give up her bus seat to a white person, uh, the boycott demonstrated the potential of grassroots organization and brought Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. into the national spotlight. In 1957, King and others founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, uh, which would play a major role in advancing the cause of civil rights. So let's move forward then and look at our first subsection, nonviolent civil disobedience. Brown had been the law of the land for barely a year when a single act of violence struck at the heart of black America. A 14-year-old African-American boy from Chicago, Emmett Till, uh, was murdered for flirting with a white woman in a Mississippi store. Photos of Till's mutilated body in Jet Magazine brought national attention to this heinous crime. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks a seamstress in Montgomery, Alabama, refused to give up her seat on a city bus to a white man. She was arrested and charged with violating a local segregation ordinance. Once the die was cast, the black community turned for leadership to the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., the recently appointed pastor of Montgomery's Dexter Street Baptist Church. The son of a prominent, prominent black minister in Atlanta, King embraced the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, whose campaigns of passive resistance had led to India's independence from Britain in 1947. Um, the whole idea behind passive resistance and nonviolent uh, civil disobedience was to allow the authorities um, who are promoting unjust laws to be violent, to do what they needed to do to you, um, but you, you could never respond. Uh, Gandhi's followers and King's followers were subjected to tremendous violence, um, but they never lashed back. They never responded back with violence. And that was core to the teachings of Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. And this led uh, greatly towards the success of King's movement. Now, after Rosa Parks' arrest, King endorsed a plan by a local black woman's organization to boycott Montgomery's bus system until it was integrated. Uh, the Montgomery bus boycott catapulted King to national prominence. In 1957, along with the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, he founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, again, the SCLC, uh, based in Atlanta. The black church, long the center of African American social and cultural life, now lent its moral and organizational strength to the civil rights movement. The battle for civil rights entered a new phase then in Greensboro, North Carolina, when on February 1st, 1960, four black college students took seats at the whites only lunch counter at the local Woolworths. They were determined to sit in until they were served. Although they were arrested, the sit-in tactic worked. The Woolworths lunch counter was desegregated and sit-ins quickly spread to other southern cities. After the Woolworths lunch counter sit-in, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and a woman named Ella Baker helped to organize the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. 
uh, in order to facilitate more sit-ins by blacks demanding an end to segregation. The Congress of Racial Equality then organized the Freedom Rides on bus lines in the South to call attention to segregation on public transportation. The activists were attacked several times by white moms. Although President Kennedy remained cautious on supporting civil rights, he ordered his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, to send federal marshals to Alabama to restore the order um, and to stop the violence that was occurring to the Freedom Riders. So let's go to the next section, legislating civil rights. When thousands of black demonstrators, organized by Martin Luther King Jr., marched to picket Birmingham, Alabama's department stores, television cameras captured the severe methods used against them by Bull Connors. President Kennedy responded to the incident on June 11, 1963, when he went on television to promise major legislation banning discrimination in public accommodations and empowering the Justice Department to enforce desegregation. Black leaders hailed Kennedy's speech as the second Emancipation Proclamation. Yet, on the evening of that very address, Medgar Evers, the president of the Mississippi chapter of the NAACP, was shot and killed. To rouse then the conscience of the nation uh, and to marshal support for Kennedy's bill, civil rights leaders launched a massive civil rights march on Washington in 1963, which culminated in Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. King's eloquence and the sight of blacks and whites marching together did more than anything else to make the civil rights movement acceptable to white Americans. It also marked the high point of the civil rights movement and confirmed King's position as the leading speaker for the African American cause. Now, some civil rights activists were more radical than King. During the next few years, there were conflicts among the black activists uh, over tactics and goals that were to transform the movement. Southern senators blocked the civil rights legislation, and there was an outbreak of violence by white extremists. Four black Sunday school students were killed when a Birmingham, Alabama church was bombed. On assuming the presidency um, after Kennedy's assassination, Lyndon Johnson made passing a civil rights bill a priority. On June 19, in June 1964, Congress approved the most far-reaching civil rights law since Reconstruction. Uh, the keystone of the Civil Rights Act, uh, Title VII, outlawed discrimination in employment on the basis of race, religion, national origin, and sex. Another section guaranteed equal access to public accommodations and schools. In 1964, black organizations mounted a major campaign in Mississippi. Known as Freedom Summer, the effort drew several thousand volunteers from across the country, including nearly 1,000 white college students from the North. They established uh, freedom schools for black children and conducted a major voter registration drive. So determined was the opposition that only about 1,200 black voters were registered that summer uh, at a cost of four murdered civil rights workers and 37 black churches bombed or burned. The murders strengthened the resolve of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the MFDP, which had been founded during the Freedom Summer. Uh, banned from the white-only Mississippi Democratic Party, MFDP leaders were determined to attend the 1964 Democratic National Convention as the legitimate representatives of their state. <clears throat> Inspired by Fannie Lou Hamer, a former sharecropper turned civil rights activist, uh, the MFDP challenged the most powerful figures in the Democratic Party. When party officials ceded the white Mississippi delegation, and refused to recognize the MFDP, civil rights activists left, convinced that the Democratic Party would not change. 
In March of 1965, James Bevel of the SCLC called for a march from Selma, Alabama to the state capitol in Montgomery to protest the murder of a voting rights activist. As soon as the 600 marchers left Selma, crossing over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, mounted state troopers attacked them with tear gas and clubs. The scene was shown on national television that night and became known as Bloody Sunday. Calling the episode an American tragedy, President Johnson went back to Congress. The Voting Rights Act, which was then passed on August 6th of 1965, outlawed the literacy tests and other devices that prevented blacks from registering the vote and authorized the Attorney General to send federal examiners to register voters in any county where registration was less than 50%. In the South, then, the results were stunning. In 1960, only 20% of blacks had been, had been registered to vote. By 1971, registration reached 62%. Something else would never go back either. Uh, the Liberal New Deal Coalition. By the second half of the 1960s, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party had won its battle with the conservative segregationist wing. Democrats had embraced the civil rights movement and made African American equality a cornerstone of the new rights liberalism. But over the next generation, between the 1960s and the 1980s, Southern whites and many conservative Northern whites would respond by switching to the Republican Party. Okay, so this does conclude our video lecture for today. Go ahead and answer your review questions and continue on with your reading and your work.